Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with cream puff crack buns. That's right, if you like cream puffs and you like cracks, you are going to love what my French friends would call chou au croquelin. And quite often with these classic French pastries, I'll simply translate the French into English and just call the recipe that. But since that actually translates to cracker cabbage, I decided not to, and instead went with what I thought was a fairly clever double entendre. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by mixing up our very simple sugar crack coating. And all we're gonna need for that is some soft butter, some light brown sugar, some all-purpose flour, and a pinch of salt. And that is it. We'll simply take a spatula and mix this all together. In the first 10 to 15 seconds of this operation, all we're really doing is trying not to knock everything out of the bowl, since that's really easy to do. But once this starts to smear together, we can get a little more aggressive. And then we'll simply keep mixing and mashing, smearing and smashing, until the mixture looks a little something like this. And then what we'll do once that's been accomplished is transfer this onto either some wax paper or some parchment, or in my case, a cut open zip top bag. And we'll wanna press this out to something just under an eighth of an inch or so. And depending on how soft your butter was, you could do this with your hands or a rolling pin or the bottom of a pot. It really doesn't matter as long as you get it pretty even. Oh, and speaking of even, I kind of wanted to have this more in a rectangle shape than an oval, just so it would be a little easier to cut out my circles later. So I stopped and used my bend scraper to trim off the edges and kind of square things up, which I've sped up here so as not to waste your valuable time. And then once I had that redistributed into more of a rectangular shape, I continued pressing that out. And I realize it's not that easy to see the exact thickness yet, but when this is cut and placed on our dough, you're going to get a great look at it. And then what we'll do once that's been spread, pressed, or rolled out, as even as humanly possible, is go ahead and transfer that into the freezer until needed. At which point we can move on to the pâté chou. And for that we will add some butter to some cold fresh water, along with a pinch of salt. And over medium heat we'll go ahead and bring that up to a simmer. At which point we're going to dump in our flour all at once. And then using our most experienced wooden spoon, we're going to carefully stir this together. And by the way, feel free to use a pan with higher sides. I'm using this one because I'm making a small batch and I want you to be able to see what's going on. And what's going on is, as we cook this over medium stirring, this mixture will eventually pull together and form kind of a shiny dough. And you'll know things are going pretty well when it kind of pulls cleanly off the bottom of the pan. Okay, at first it's gonna kind of stick and smear on the bottom, but as it continues to cook, the moisture in the mixture will kind of deglaze what's on the bottom and pull it into the dough. And in a minute or two, you'll see the bottom of your pan should be relatively clean. And once that happens, I usually cook this for another couple minutes, at which point it's basically done. Or at least this phase is. Because what we need to do now is remove it from the heat and transfer it into a mixing bowl to cool down. All right, not all the way. Basically until it's just very warm. And since things that are spread out always cool a lot quicker than things in a lump, I'm going to go ahead and break this up and spread it out with my whisk. And like I said, we'll let that sit there for about 10 minutes until it's somewhere right around very warm. And then once this mixture has cooled down a little bit, we'll go ahead and incorporate the first of two eggs. And if you want, you can do this step with just a spatula, but it does take longer, so I generally go with the whisk. The only problem with the whisk, though, is that when it does come together, it all clumps on the inside, which is no big deal. That's totally normal. And when that does happen, we'll just take our spatula and clean it off. And we'll go ahead and add the second egg. And we'll repeat that process until it's incorporated. And by the way, for a few seconds during this step, it's going to look like something went tragically wrong and that your mixture is basically broken. And believe it or not, a lot of times people will stop and throw this away and start over because they think something's wrong, but it's not. Just be brave and keep whisking. And you'll see it will all come together. So never, ever stop halfway through this process. And just like the first egg incorporation, once that stuff gets all stuck into the whisk, we'll switch to the spatula and finish mixing it the rest of the way with that. And once that's all been incorporated, that's it. You've just successfully made a pâté chou, one of the most versatile doughs in all the pastry world. And then once our dough's done, we can transfer that into a pastry bag and start piping out our puffs, which will eventually become what we're calling crack buns. And as I mentioned, I'm doing a small batch, and this amount of dough is going to make between 6 and 8, depending on how big you make them. And because it's a lucky number, I went with 7. Plus, that gives me exactly what I think is the perfect size for this. And what I generally like to do is pipe out as many as I'm going to make, 
And then with what's ever left in the bag, I'll go ahead and even them all up. And for something like this, we really do want to try to get them exact. So I'll go around and add a little touch to the ones that look a little small. Until, like I mentioned, they're as even as possible. And then it's probably not a big deal here, because we're going to top these. But generally, once you pipe a pate shoe, you want to use a wet finger to go ahead and smooth it out. And sort of fix any misshapen parts. So with a dampened finger, I did poke these here and there until they were as equally and evenly shaped as possible. At which point we can go ahead and pull our crackle on mixture out of the freezer and cut it using a round cutter that's ideally the exact same size as the dough we just piped. Okay, a touch smaller is fine and maybe even a touch bigger is fine, but ideally we want something just about the same diameter. And once those are cut, we'll place them right on top. And as these are placed on, we wanna push down just a little bit, but not too much. Otherwise, we're not gonna get those beautiful round buns. And we'll end up with flat buns instead. Okay, so push it down a little so it's securely placed, but do not flatten these out. So we'll go ahead and top each one, at which point these are ready to pop in the oven. And by the way, I cannot stress to you enough how much my relatively random placement is bothering the professional patissiers in the audience. They are not happy right now. But the point is it doesn't matter. As long as we have at least a few inches of space between each one, they're gonna bake up just fine. Speaking of which, once those are set, we can go ahead and transfer those into the center of a 450 degree oven, but we're not gonna stay at that temperature. As soon as we close the oven door, we're gonna lower our heat from 450 to 350, at which point we're gonna cook these for about 30 to 40 minutes, okay, depends on the size, or until they are beautifully puffed and have baked up to a gorgeous golden brown. All right, and the bottom should be golden brown as well. And as you can see, that butter sugar flour mixture we put on top, has sort of cracked apart as these puffs expanded, giving it its signature appearance. So yes, these came out looking exactly like we want. But let's not start patting each other's backs quite yet. Since what we want to do as soon as these come out of the oven is transfer them onto a cooling rack, and then transfer that rack back onto the pan, and then allow these to cool slowly in our turned off, cracked open oven. Okay, the oven's off, just put them back in and leave the door open. And that way they're going to cool nice and slowly which means they're not gonna sink or droop. And our final product will be even crispier and more amazing. So we'll go ahead and let those cool completely. And then if you want, and I highly recommend you do, I'm gonna go ahead and spoon some melted dark chocolate on the bottom. Not too much, just a couple teaspoons. Just barely covering that bottom. And then what's gonna happen is I place these back onto the pan and sort of give them a little press and a subtle wiggle. That chocolate's gonna spread out and create a gorgeous chocolate base. The only catch is, you gotta let that chocolate harden completely before you try to peel these off the baking mat. And by the way, I just do that at room temperature. It is a lot quicker if you pop them in the fridge, but the change in temperature and humidity of the fridge is gonna cause that sugar crack coating to not be as crispy. So I just let mine sit out for an hour or two until that chocolate hardens up, at which point we can peel them off. Which reminds me, never ever pull a crack bun. Otherwise we can tear that delicate pastry. Okay, you always want to go underneath the mat with your fingers and remove it this way. Oh, and if you're wondering why I didn't do the old fork test, I was afraid I was going to chip a crack because it can flake off. But don't worry, you're going to hear one later when I cut it. All right, and at this point, we are down to our last step, filling these with whatever we want. And the easiest way is just to cut off the top third, fill them, and then put the top back on. But for something that looks even better and is way more devious, what I like to do is cut out a little piece Okay, following the natural contours of my cracks. And once I've removed that little piece, I'll be able to pipe in whatever I'm using. And then we'll plug that back up and it will basically be invisible. And today I'm gonna to be filling these with our famous vanilla bean pastry cream, which I'm gonna give you a link for. It is truly amazing and my favorite filling for these. But you can also use things like whipped cream or a combination of whipped cream and pastry cream or other stuff like lemon curd or coconut cream or chocolate cream or like a million other things. So I went ahead and piped that full, and then we'll replace that piece we cut out, and we'll sort of push it back in place the best we can. And that's it, once filled, we'll go ahead and transfer that to a plate, so I can go ahead and bite in and see how we did. And that, my friends, was cream puff crack bun perfection. Okay, regular cream puffs are good, but when you add a dark chocolate bottom and a crispy crust, it just takes it up to a whole other level. And by the way, I was talking about the names earlier. We could have actually called these Boston cream pie crack buns since flavor-wise, that really is what these reminded me of the most. But anyway, what you call these is gonna be up to you. 
I mean, you are after all the Paul Hollywood, of which name sounds good. And speaking of Paul Hollywood, let me go ahead and grab a serrated knife and cut one of these right through the center, just like on that British baking show, so you can hear just how crispy that crackling crust is. Oh, yeah. And yes, I did get this idea from that show. And again, you can fill these with so many different things, but I think our vanilla bean pastry cream is perfect not only taste-wise for these, but in my opinion have the perfect viscosity. All right, not too thick and stiff, but not so soft that it's running all over the place. And as far as service goes, the sooner these are eaten after being filled, the better. As far as retaining that crispiness, but just like in the bakeries, these can be filled and refrigerated, and they're still very good, just not as crispy. But either way, just a magnificent pastry, and one that looks way, way, way harder than it really is to make. So for all those reasons and more, I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy.